אשרי האיש אשר לא הלך בעצת רשעים ובדרך חטאים לא עמד ובמושב לצים לא ישב כי אם בתורת אדוני חפצו ובתורתו יהגה יומם ולילה והיה קץ שעות שתול על פגי מים אשר פריו ייתן בעיתו ועולה או לא יבול וכל אשר יעשה יצליח לא כן הרשעים כי כמוץ אשר תדפנו רוח על כן לא יקומו רשעים במשפט וחטאים בעדת צדיקים כי יודע אדוני דרך צדיקים ודרך רשעים תאבד מזמור לדוד אדוני אם יגור בעולך מי ישכום בהר קודשך הולך תמים ופועל צדק ודובר אמת בלבבו לא רגל על לשונו, לא עשה לרעהו רעה, וחרפה לא נשא על קרובו. נבזה בעיניו נמאס, ותראה אדוני יכבד. נשבע להרע ולא ימיר, <coughs> כספו לא נתן בנשך, ושוחד לא נקי לא לקח, עושה אלה לא ימות לעולם. מזמור לדוד, אדוני רועי לא יחסר, בנות דשא ירביציני על מי מנוחות ינעלני. נפשי שובב ינחיני במעגלי צדק למען שמו. גם כי ילך בגיץ המוות לא יירא רע כי אתה עמדי שבטך ומשענתך אימה ינחמוני תערוך לפני שולחן נגד צוררי נשמת בשם אל ראשי כוסי רוויה אך טוב החסר דודפוני כל מי חיי ושבתי בבית אדוני לאורך ימים. I met Greg 25, close to 25 years ago. We just moved to Solon from New York. I mean, my wife, she met them, Miriam met them first, and, they, I, and then I met them. Right from the beginning, we told them we came to open a synagogue in Solon. It was just the beginning of the big move to, of the Jewish community to this neighborhood. And he, as a true entrepreneur, got all excited and says, you'll make it, you'll do it, go for it. And he used to give me his pep talks, like, you, I, I believe in you. He believed in me more than I believed in myself. And he was right away ready to help and to do whatever it takes. Then we met Jennifer. We met the key. He told me about his sons, Ari and David. And Mark and Yale, I met them before they met me, basically. Before they even knew as babies, I remember them. While as with the relationship got closer, They introduced me to another couple, Mark and Annette Kubinski, and we started to have study sessions together in, his, in the Goldberg's house. I think it was every second week for years. It's so a very exciting discussions. It was a lot of fun and very deep discussions. And we formed a very strong relationship with, the, with both the families, and the Goldberg used to be guest on our Seder, Seder table for many years. I'm sure the two, Mark and Yale, remember that very well. To, to understand, Greg was born 61 years ago. But to really understand Greg, we need to go to one event in his life that anybody knew him knows that this event shaped his life or changed his life. It was when he was 15 years old. His, <coughs> his, his mother was uh, passed away. He was 15, Wendy, his sister, was 18. Brett was younger, he was 12. But it wasn't when he was only 15. She got sick when he was 12. And these three years, from the age of 12 till the age of 15, and then later not, not having a mother, that, was, that really shaped him in the whole way of life that he behaved, everything that he did, every, every move that he made, every person that he measured by, was by this experience that he had. I remember talking to him about Mark's bar mitzvah. Mark was seven or eight years old. And we had a discussion. Somehow the discussion came about the plans for his bar mitzvah. And he told me that he was afraid. He said, my mother got sick before, that his mother got sick before his bar mitzvah. And he's afraid <coughs> it will happen the same to him. 
that he, he was basically afraid that he will die before the bar mitzvah. I don't know if he had the same fears before Ari and David bar mitzvahs, because I wasn't involved in his life at that time, but that's what he told me that. And then when it came to Yale bar mitzvah, we had the same discussions again. And no matter how many times I told them that he has many years in life, he, was, he always had these fears because it was when he had the same experience. I think he told me that they made this bar mitzvah a little earlier just to make sure that his mother can attend this bar mitzvah. Greg went to college and attended scholarship. And even before that, Wendy told me on Friday that she was she used to sit and study upstairs, and he was the garage was underneath, and he used to sit and hack in his in the head the whole time with the tennis, with the playing tennis as much as she wanted to concentrate. That's a, that's how strong and willed it was about it. I would say that, um, and then he became a, a tennis coach, but it wasn't. It was more than just teaching tennis for uh, Greg. He was the chief rabbi of tennis. He was busy. He was like a rabbi. You know, a rabbi will teach you if you want or you don't want. If you're uh, Greg was teaching tennis, if you pay them and if you didn't pay him, he was ready to teach anybody. And he was so passionate about it. The only person he didn't want to teach was me. Once I asked him, maybe you teach me tennis. It, he looks at me, he smiled, and he told me, Rabbi, I don't have enough time. You do not have enough money. <laughs> Greg was full of passion and enthusiasm and full of life. And as Friday, Wendy and Lydia, we met her in the last two and a half years, Lydia Parker, both of them said that when he loved somebody, it was all the way. It was not, the, the, the everything that he had, all his emotions were so clear and so, everything that he did was full, full, uh, all the way, not a half, nothing was a half away. He never pretended to be something that is not. The band that he had with his sister Wendy, from very young age, she was a big support for him. She was older than him. And the difference between 18 and 15 at this age is huge. Every time she said he, she came to town and he took her out for to a restaurant, he insisted to pay. And she used to come, he used to come to, va to Chicago, other places, wherever she was, and she wanted to pay for the restaurant, he disagreed. He wanted to pay, he insisted that he's doing it. And she, she was very important in his life, that has very strong bond and very strong connection. But the big love that Greg had is to the four sons. Anybody who knows them knows how much he was proud of his children, how much that was he saw in, him, he saw in them himself. And he accomplished something unbelievable. Even he had two children from one marriage and two sons from the other marriage. He made sure that the relationship between them should be like they are all from the same family, from the same mother and father. It should be very, they should be, should be a strong bond and a strong connection. And he really accomplished that. But when you meet the boys, Ari, David, Mark, and Yale, you see, you see Greg there, Greg fingerprint. I met Ari now. I asked him, what are you doing? What is he doing? He tells me he's starting a new business. You know, many men, some men, lose their hair in a, in a, some younger, some older, some uh, much older. And he's starting a new, a new technique. They discovered a new technique that uh, can grow up a man's ear back. And he's opening a clinic in California. And then in New York, if you come to Cleveland, that'll be one of your customers. <laughs> I'm sure you'll give me a good deal. <laughs> I know I'm not doing any justice to your new business, but uh, may, you never know. I asked David, what are you doing? He tells me he's starting a new business. He's selling vitamin supplements for patient, uh, cancer patients. After he saw what happened to his father, he wants to help other people. Mark is a tennis coach. And Yale, who is still in college, is playing tennis. 
That's exactly Greg, he's an entrepreneur and playing tennis. That's what his life is all about. Then you look at the kids, beside what they do in life, also their mannerism, their talk, their smile, everything, their love, their sincerity, it's all just like, like the father. When I visited your father two weeks ago, David was there. I mean, he wasn't there in the room at the time. I talked to him, he couldn't talk much. But when I mentioned the kids, the boys, he started to cry. Six months ago, <coughs> when he got sick, he came to, to visit me, to talk to me. What, I, what I was so unique about him, he didn't complain. He, he never complained, but especially they didn't complain. He didn't ask why me. He didn't quetch about it. He dealt with it. He told me, if anybody can beat it, it's me. But we talked about the future, and it was with so much dignity and honor it was that he handled himself was really, really very, very unique. In the last six months, all the love that he gave to people, these people gave him back. If it was his sister, Randy, who came to be with him, his sons, all four of them, especially I saw a lot, David. But more than everybody was Lydia. She took care of him in the last, especially the last six months, he was sick, day and night. And he, when she got to know him only the last two and a half years, but she was, she was there for him all the time. And he told me a few times how much he appreciates her and he loves her. And I was looking in the Bible as a rabbi, I was looking in the Bible for something or somebody or something that can remind us Greg. I thought I'd have to look a lot, but I didn't. It reminded me the burning bush. When Moses saw the burning bush, what caught his attention? That it's burning and burning and it's not being consumed. The bush is still there and the fire is going on and on. To describe Greg, those 61 years of it was a burning bush. The fire was there constantly. He never slowed down. You meet him, you meet him a year later, two years later, 10 years later, 20 years later. He's full of life and energy and excited. Whenever he talks about it, full of, uh, it's full of love and passion. The body got tired. But Greg's fire will continue through his children. He wanted very much grandchildren. Wendy told me she just had a, grand a grandchild. She told me she will, she told him we will share this grandchild. He will have his grandchildren, but he will not see them physically. He will see them from above. Greg, Greg, uh, Jewish traditions were very important to Greg, and Judaism in general. His kids will continue his tradition, and they continue the fire that Greg had and give it over to the generations to come. And now we're going to hear from his wonderful four sons. We'll start from the youngest to the oldest. Then uh, Yale will be the first. Nothing makes me emotional like seeing Rabbi Zushi cry, so I hope I can hold on for the next minute, minute or so. Um, I'd first like to thank you all uh, for coming to celebrate or begin the celebration that my father always dreamed of. Uh, as I look around the room, as I expected, uh, I see a lot of great friends to my father, and I see a lot of children whose lives my father helped shape. Those of you who knew my father don't need an explanation of who he was or what he stood for. He made that very clear. Today I'd like to tell you that I don't feel sorry for myself, and I hope you guys don't feel sorry for yourselves. Uh, my dad would be really disappointed if that were the case. I consider myself extremely lucky to have had his unconditional love for 21 years. And I hope that you guys consider yourselves lucky as well, whether his part in your life was big or small, he left an impact on everyone he saw. So thank you again for coming, um, and I look forward to the rest of the celebration. Mark?
I had a uh, a speech written, but um, it didn't feel right for some reason. Um, so instead, uh, I decided to take steam at Beachmont. <laughs> Post workout, of course, and. Uh, took out a piece of Beachmont paper and wrote uh, three things, which was uh, be the best you, accept others, and enjoy the ride. I have uh, so many stories that I could share with all of you guys, um, but three uh, go with these three things that I wrote down. Um, when I was 12 years old, I was playing in a Midwestern tournament, one of the biggest in the Midwest. And uh, I was playing up in age group in the 14s. Um, I was playing a very, very large boy. Questionable if he was 14. <laughs> um, but uh, he was top in, top 50 in the country, top 10 in the Midwest. And I lost a close match, 7-6, uh, 7-6. Seven, six, seven, six. Um, my dad wasn't too happy with that. <laughs> so in front of about 50 people, after all my friends congratulated me for playing good tennis, my dad took the glasses that I wore each time and stepped on them and broke the lenses. He then took my cooler, my lucky cooler, and threw it against a brick wall and broke it. He then left me there for 20 minutes. <laughs> he came back uh, with pizza and cookies. But uh, that was one of the lessons that my dad taught me. Um, it wasn't about other people. It was to be the best you you could be. And he knew that I could have been better. The second is accepting others. Uh, my dad had the weirdest way of doing it, and I, I didn't understand it. Um, and it could really be seen best uh, with the teaching in tennis. If you guys only knew the people who would come to Beachwood High School tryouts saying they could play tennis, it was an adventure. It didn't matter what you looked like. It didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter what racket you had. He really just cared about the fight. And over these, uh, you know, as a son, I always, you know, I had to fight or else he was going to yell at me. So <laughs> I just did it. But, uh, over these last couple weeks, um, you know, I've been talking with my family and the support that we have um, goes beyond friends. Um, we are all a family. Uh, the lessons that he taught um, on the court have been so clear with so many kids and uh, I mean, you know, when a 13-year-old girl writes you who I have no idea who she is, and then there's a guy in Israel, there's a guy who moved back to India, there's a guy who's becoming a doctor, there's a couple who just got married, uh, and they all thank my dad. Um, and uh, he was always Superman to me, but uh, I think that says something. When so many people from different backgrounds I'll come back to one guy, one thing, one lesson, um, and they bring it back. I'm gonna move my feet for him. <laughs> the last one, which he would be disappointed in me probably the most, is to enjoy the ride. I guess I never got it um, until he was sick. 
I'm kind of the square, I guess, when you look at the other four guys. <laughs> Don't really drink, even though I sell beer for a living. Um, but the way that my dad celebrated everything is something that I hope all of you guys do. And there never was a reason. He always just said, cause life. We would pass by a bakery. <laughs> well, that's, we, we should go in there. Why? Cause life. Oh, okay. Two dozen cookies, okay. <laughs> my dad would take shots with my friends. I would watch. <laughs> take a shot. Eh, I'm good. I'll take two. Okay. <laughs> But uh, today, um, man, there's a lot of people. Uh, I look at all you guys, and um, I ask all of you uh, to look to your left, look to your right, introduce yourself to a new face, hug a loved one, and share your favorite Greg stories. I know as I try to be on a good diet, um, break it. Make today an exception. Go to the gym if you don't normally go, or if you do. Have a cookie, have an extra shot. And again, uh, just remember to smile and be happy. Because you must enjoy the ride. Thank you guys so much. guys, I'm David, um, Greg's only ninja son. Uh, <laughs> thanks for not calling me out on that, Mark. I was sure it was coming. It was, uh, it was coming. It was coming. Um, the truth is I didn't prepare anything uh, because I, I don't quite really know what to say. Um, the greatest gift that I got from my dad is super clear. <laughs> and I think uh, in his way, it's... Uh, forcing upon me the, the importance of what it means to be there for somebody, uh, but also what it means to allow others to be there for you. The greatest trait uh, that Greg hold, uh, held in, in his life that I was always so envious of, especially as I got older, uh, was his ability to be vulnerable and to be loved and to be hated, to yell because he wanted to, to do that ridiculously crazy thing that he shouldn't or maybe couldn't do, uh, but he would try. And that vulnerability was a way in which, for me at least, he taught me to expand my emotional capacity. And he always said, if it hurts a lot, it means you can love a lot. Um, and he's right. When I was little, and I, I don't really know if this was the same for you guys, but um, we didn't grow up a lot of that time with Greg, but every time he'd put me to bed, he would say the same three things. You're a champion, David Goldberg. You're a champion, David Goldberg. You're a champion, David Goldberg. Over the past months, uh, <laughs> I caught myself saying that to him every time I would leave. Uh, cause that man was a champion. And uh, I don't see this as a losing battle. I see this as a battle won because he was so dignified, because he was so willing to be vulnerable, especially with his boys, and to share everything. No question, no rock unturned. Championship, I think, to Greg, uh, as he would say to me much later in life, and Mark and Yale, I don't think, got these lessons on the court. Uh, he always tell me that it's not about winning. Losing is a big part of it, too. But how you fight, how you persevere, and how you hold yourself through that process is what really makes a champion. Uh, there will be a lot of sadness. Um, and I think that for Greg's sake, we should embrace that, too. But I think... For me, the beautiful thing is that I, in particular, get to look at three dudes back there, and uh, we're going to be laughing a lot. And Mark was right. Uh, take a shot, eat a cookie, whatever illicit activity you choose to participate in. Uh, Greg would not say no. Uh, <laughs>
but we're really appreciative for you all being here and uh, I've the very fortunate honor of introducing the eldest Goldberg brother, uh, Ari, who's starting a new business. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Val. How you guys doing? A little sad. It's okay to be sad. Um, so following Yale, uh, I do want to thank all of you guys for coming, uh, mostly because for a while, uh, Dave and I thought it was just going to be the four of us and Dad. Uh, <laughs> so, so the fact that you all showed up uh, kind of is a big testament to, to how far the big guy came, uh, mostly because my dad was an asshole. And <laughs> I tell you that because first, I think he'd want me to tell you that, and that he was totally fine with it. Um, <laughs> also because uh, you know, later in life I learned, uh, one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes is, it's OK to be an asshole, as long as you're passionate about it. And I think one of Greg Goldberg's blessings, and certainly one of his curses, w was his passion. Uh, and the irony of all that is that's why we loved him so much. Um, that's also why we hated him so much, but it's really why we loved him so much because I think in a day and age when people are so disingenuous, uh, for better and worse, uh, Greg Goldberg was, was, was very passionate about everything that he did. And unfortunately, I didn't think I was gonna get emotional. Um, unfortunately, uh, for a lot of my dad's life, I think his ego and his emotions got in the way of a lot of things, uh, certainly a lot of his relationships, probably with a lot of people in this room. And towards the end, he kind of came to terms with a lot of those things. Um, you know, his ego made him stubborn, his emotions drove a lot of his decision making, and he just became a lot more fluid um, as he got later in life. And I w I've been thinking a lot that, you know, one of the great lessons we can take from my dad is it's okay to have an ego, it's okay to have emotions, but don't let them affect your decision making. You know, um, you know, too many grudges that him and I spoke about that you can, you have a choice during your time. You can, you would talk about fighting, we should fight, we should fight. Well, no, you shouldn't always fight. Um, and, and part of his issue was that he fought so much of his life. And I think, again, the fact that there's so many people in this room uh, shows that especially near the end of his life, he just didn't fight as much. He realized that there was better uses of time uh, to love and to spend time with people. Um, and I said to him at one point, I said, you know, Pops, you've, you've had enough grudges. Why don't we try to go to the grave this time with as few as possible? And uh, I think he ended up in the end uh, doing, doing pretty good about that. Uh, I think you know one of the most amazing things that's happened, um, and I'm sure the Cone family is out here, and I always think about you guys when I tell this, is how many stories over the past weeks and months we've heard about my dad. Um, so many of the emails and the messages that we've gotten from people um, telling these stories, uh, where I said to Mrs. Cohen, like, you guys make him out to sound like a saint, and I know for a fact he was not. And my mother's over there, and she can attest that he definitely was not. Um, <laughs> And, you know, <laughs> I, lo I looked at Ms. Cohen and I was just like, are we talking about the same person? Because, you know, these stories that you guys tell, he's so great, he taught me so many lessons, my kids wouldn't be the same without him. I'm looking at me and Dave and I'm like, <laughs> glad he got the practice on us. Um, <laughs> so it's what we, we always call Mark and Yale, we call him 2.0. We call Yale 4.0, but he kind of, he worked out a lot of the kinks with Dave and I, thank God. Um, so Didi touched on it, um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys in this room uh, could talk about it. Um, but you know, one of the big things uh, that our dad always taught us, and I'm sure taught a lot of you, uh, was this idea of competing. And, and I thought about that, uh, you know, two things he said to me that, that kind of stuck with me. The first, the first thing was this idea of competing. Uh, the second thing I'll come back to. But you know, I thought about why he always used the word compete and, and not necessarily the word win. Because I, I, I caught myself telling a friend a story, and I was like, all my dad ever cared about was winning. And 
it felt right, but then I realized that that actually wasn't wrong, or that wasn't right. Greg, Greg Goldberg cared that you competed, and, and I think Mobile, uh, Mark, was attesting to that. And I think my dad understood inherently, whether he could articulate it or not, that you don't always win. You know, life isn't always fair. Sometimes your mom dies when you're 15. And that can't hold you back. The one thing that you can control is not the win, not the guy on the other side of the court, uh, but your ability uh, to compete. And I think that that's something that we'll all take um, that I'm, I'm quite proud of. The other thing that stuck with me uh, that dad said when he got sick was he was, he was crying. And my dad was an emotional guy, but had a good ability to, to kind of hold back his emotions. And especially some of the drugs made him so loopy. He was like hyper emotional. And was, there was weeks where he was just crying straight. And he said to us, he said, he said, don't be sad. These are tears of joy. I thought that was pretty profound from the big guy who actually got pretty profound in, in his old age. Um, and I, Dave touched on it the best, I think. Uh, for all his faults and flaws, the best thing he did for me uh, was give me these guys, um, because initially it was just me. Now you guys are here. Um, the uh, uh, Dave, uh, obviously, I've spent the most time with. Um, I love David Goldberg more than I love anybody in this world. Um, I think that David Goldberg's the coolest. Uh, now that he looks older than me, I still like think of him as my older brother. Um, and there, I could spend days talking about Dave. Uh, but most importantly, in the context of dad, um, we are all here now, not years ago, because of David Goldberg. My dad would have died legally, financially, emotionally, physically years ago uh, if it was not for my brother David, who is selfless to a fault um, and was able to not just get my dad to a place where, you know, I was just gonna say at the end, but the sad part of this whole situation for me is, is not that he, you know, you don't decide when you come or you go. It's that he was a guy that really came full circle. And that's the sad part to me, is that he finally ended up in this place where he was content. And that contentment uh, is only possible because of, of Dave's actions. Uh, and I think we're all grateful for that, Dave. And I'm excited now, and I know Dad wants you to take this time and focus it on you because uh, you've done your part, and you certainly did it for Dad. Mobile. Mobile, you gave a great speech. I hope to see you speak more. That was very funny. Um, mobile, uh, Dad always referred to as the glue, uh, the one that held us together. Uh, he is the sweetest of us. Uh, he is the most humble of us. Um, he is the most compassionate of us. He is the most willing to listen and patient of us. Um, and he's just the gem. Mobile, you're, you're just the gem, and I think, you know, I, the picture you posted the other day with dad when you guys uh, won the championship, I think, you know, of all the accomplishments, that was something that dad just held so near and dear because he knew how much you fought for that. And I love that that one picture uh, encompasses all that. And uh, another, just side note, uh, dad really picked it for a guy for years hated his cell phone. And his excuse was, don't call me. I got stuff to do. Just because you're bored, don't call me. It's like, Greg, you're an idiot. Just pick up the damn phone. We're obviously trying to communicate some information. Um, so <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but uh, dad got into social media and Instagram and Facebook and all these things. And we were looking through the pictures. And especially you know, the past few months, there's so many good pictures. And just to go back to Dave for a second. Uh, sorry, and if this runs over, just tell me. Um, but. So we went to a, we went to a, we were downtown for dinner and Yale, it's raining. And Yale's got this ridiculous idea. He goes, you guys want to go to the Indians game? And we said, sure, that's a terrific idea. There was a rain delay, so the game started late. And we walk in and, and dad had gotten a little tired, so Yale took, took dad back. Uh, me, Dave, uh, Missy Beck and cousin Mikey Jacobs go and we sit in the good seats, no one's really there. And long story short is we had been talking about catching a foul ball and we caught a foul ball which is amazing. And clearly that was destined from God, uh, from dad. And that was a great story as it was. So obviously we started talking about catching a second foul ball. And a couple of minutes later, we caught a second foul ball. Uh, the odds are one in 40 million that you will catch. We looked it up. 
and all these things have happened and there there's clearly some flow to this but anyways back to the brothers um so mobile you're terrific dad's very proud of you um yale yale we affectionately call 4.0 dad called him champ um, I had the great pleasure of running into my prototype, Doug Bloom, uh, in the Beachmont locker room a couple days ago. And uh, before there was me, there was Doug. And that's who dad beat up on and started practicing all these techniques. I grew up hearing how Dougie Bloom was the greatest and such the best athlete. And dad had this immense proudness of, of Doug until Yale came along, at which point dad's level of pride went through the roof. And the fact that Greg Goldberg has a son who's the captain of the tennis team at Stanford is something that no one would have ever believed. And the fact that you are at, we could not be more proud of. So I know you have other wonderful qualities which we can address later, but I think that whole concept, um, you know, that's all dad ever wanted. Dad just wanted you. And you know, it took three tries to get there and we got there. <laughs> and we're all very proud of you. <laughs> um, so I'll get near the end, but uh, so you know I think um, my mom borderline yelled at me just now. Missy just kind of yelled at me now. I'm I'm not really that emotional over this. I got to be honest with you, and I'm not really sad. I'm sad for the reason that I just talked about. Um, but you know my dad and I had a talk uh, driving Chagrin River Road to his river house, which he just thought was the coolest, and it is. Um, and I said to him, I said, you know, Dad, one of the great things about you was you never took all of this for granted. You know, he wasn't a guy that acted in all the areas that he acted with hubris. It wasn't in life. And I think it was because so early on when he lost his mother, he realized none of this was really promised to us. Um, so is it sad he didn't get another 20 years, 30 years? Of course, that's terrible. Um, but, you know, they say it's not it's not the life in your years, it's the, uh, I'm sorry, it's not the years in your life, it's the life in your years. Um, and I think he showed that. And I think he also showed an unbelievable humility in this, uh, this quote I've been reading recently um, that says, we are immortals in all that we desire and mortals in all that we fear. And my dad was like a tough guy. Nothing really, really bothered this guy. And the, the word cancer, you just kind of saw him come back to a centeredness. And he had a respect for the disease and its power, um, but also a respect for the life um, th that was lived uh, until it got it. So um, I am sad, but I, I don't think that, I don't think, this, is, this could have been much worse. Ever since this happened, I said uh, to friends, I said, you know what would really suck? If we were running through the streets of Syria and dad was trying to get us out of a war zone. Okay? Greg Goldberg lived in a country club. He traveled the world. He had four great kids. Uh, he went to a lot of parties. Um, I think I see Doug and Bruce, which is an amazing thing that you're here uh, because you exemplify all the people in this room. The messages and the emails that we've received from people about dad, especially from our friends. Our dad always said that we had the best friends and you guys are the best friends. And he got to bond with so many of you because unlike so many dads, he actually was out there with us every night. Um, and that was an amazing thing. So um, I'm sad uh, uh, because this, this ride has ended. I'm, I'm absolutely joyous because he got this much life. And I think as Dave touched on, um, this, the thing that would suck is if we came here and just cried and, and told old war stories. Greg Goldberg would want you to celebrate. And the only thing that he's pissed off about is that he's not here celebrating with you. Um, so the next few days, we have a choice. We can sit around, and we can mope, and we can cry. I think my dad would yell at you about that. Um, or we can celebrate. And the guy had a great run, and he has a lot to be proud of. And as David said, every night he said it to me, you're a champion, Greg Goldberg. You're a champion, Greg Goldberg. You're a champion, Greg Goldberg. And I fucking love you. Hey. Please rise for the moral service. Kel male rachamim, shochein bam romim, amtei menuchan echona al kanfei ashkina, 
במעלות קדושים וטהורים כזוהר הרקיע מזהירים את נשמת גיורא בן ג'רמיה שהלך לעולמו בעבור שאנחנו מתפללים בעד השכרת נשמתו בגן עדן תהי מנוחתו לכן בעל הרחמים יסתירהו בסתר כנפיו לעולמים ויצרור בצרור החיים את נשמתו אדוני ונחלתו וינוח בשלום על משכבו ונאמר אמן. God, full of compassion, who dwells on high, grant proper repose on the sheltering ring, wings of your presence, in the lofty levels of the holy and pure, who shine as the brightness of the firmament, unto the soul of Greg, son of Jeremiah, who has gone to his world, and for whose memory we pray. May his repose be in paradise. May the master of compassion bring him under the cover of God's wings, and bind his soul in the bond of life. May the Lord be his heritage, and may he repose on his resting place in peace. And let us respond. Amen. You may be seated. The service will continue to Mayfield Cemetery, and after the burial, the family will see Shiva today and tomorrow at the Beachmont uh, Beachman Club. <laughs>